Dr. B, how are you doing today? Oh, I am doing fantastic. The sun is shining. I'm like, I feel like, you know, that I see the crocuses outside in the uh, garden and it's just making me feel really good. Very excited. The tennis nets are going up. People are outside. You know, you just feel good. Nice. Yeah, we were out doing a little bit of raking for recess. Yeah, Cam and I were out there raking a little bit. Um, and it was hot. We were blazing hot shorts, t-shirts. It's nice. Yeah, it is great. I actually got a sunburn, which I really shouldn't be advertising because I should know better by now to put my sunscreen on a little better. Uh, you um, fair-skinned people burn so easily. <laughs> Two so minutes true. in the sun and <laughs> baking red, all fried. <laughs> Dr. Lobster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so welcome, everybody. I see uh, Rachel here in the chat. James Lincoln, how you guys doing? Uh, welcome to another episode of Movement Longevity, the Movement Longevity Show, uh, where we talk about you know, how to get out of pain, how to improve your mobility so that you can keep moving now and for the rest of your life, freely and without pain. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a topic that is in Dr. B's wheelhouse, which is shoulder impingement. She's going to share a bit about uh, a bit of research that she found and some tips and ideas on how to properly deal with shoulder impingement. So definitely looking forward to this one. Um, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago or maybe last week is when I got it. I got a new squat rack. So back to training a little bit. And my first workout it's really simple, four exercises, the back squats, nothing too heavy. Like I think I was, my working set was 135 pounds, some chin-ups, um, some push-ups, and some stiff leg or some lunges. And that was my routine. And when I was done about 10 minutes after that, I was hanging out with the kids. I got Cam from his nap and I just passed out on his floor. Like I laid down, I was so tired. I just <laughs> passed out. And it's been about a, a year now like March, last March, since we've been on lockdown, um, where I, ha I haven't done a real weight workout. And it was a real eye-opener um, because I I've done some exercises, you know, done a bit of training in my basement uh, with some dumbbells, but nothing with some barbell, heavy barbells. And just the overall um, systemic load, the lactic acid from a systemic standpoint, doing a bunch of different compound exercises really crushed me. And I think uh, something to be aware of for anybody who's getting back to training. Um, I could see how, and I was just thinking about it for the show because I could see how it's similar to coming back from an injury. And if you've been off for a while, you come back and you just, you're not anywhere near the level of performance. Um, your work, your workouts that you're doing regularly before that you were used to, it just, it crushes you. So I could just see how, uh, how it could be disheartening to get back after a, a long injury or a long layoff. Um, so I just wanted to, to remind people to, it will get better. Um, I'll, I'll share my experience as I continue to go through this um, and see how long it takes me to, to feel like normal and get back to close to normal. Um, but remember it, we will get better, the body adapts and uh, it sucks mentally. But if you push through that, maybe uh, I'm thinking a month or two, uh, you'll, you'll be back to feeling, feeling great again. So, um, other quick notes for any of you runners, especially with this great weather, we inside Rom Coach got a couple of new running routines. So the pre-run prep and the post-run restoration. And I think I mentioned them before, but we finalized the pre-run prep. And based on Lisa Bentley's feedback, Lisa is going to join us in a couple of weeks here on the show, April 8th, um, but she's 11 time Ironman champ, just an amazing athlete in person. And she gave us feedback on it. So we've revamped it based on her feedback. We split up the post-run restoration routine into two. So one you could do right when you're done your run and the other you can save uh, for after your shower, especially if you have smelly feet, smelly, sweaty feet. You might not want to be doing some of the techniques in that routine uh, before the shower. So that was great feedback from Lisa. So Lisa, thank you very much for that. Um, put it to good use. So Doc. How about you? That's me talking a lot. What's going on with you? Well, I've, uh, I've started to get back on the court and uh, I feel your pain, you know, with uh, the getting back to activities and your, that your mind and your body aren't used to. Um, but I've 
I've had this experience where I've kind of stopped and started activities previously. And I think that we'll get back faster than you, you, you realize because you've got this neurologic memory in your body. And it, after, I bet after, um, you know, a few weeks, you're really going to be just rocking it and, and uh, you'll get the endorphin high of pumping the weights and you'll be sleeping better and uh, it, yeah. it, it'll come back quickly. So it's um, whenever I tell people also, so that, you know, they've been off for an injury or they've missed their training. It's the, the mindset is so important and you have such a great mindset, um, but really being positive about it and recognizing it's just slow and steady and uh, you'll come back better. You'll end up being better because of what you've learned in the last year about movement and longevity. So Hopefully. it's, uh, yeah, yeah sure honestly. Yeah. So uh, today, actually, I wanted to share uh one of my favorite topics, of course, I love the shoulder. I don't know, for some reason, the shoulder's always been one of my favorite joints to deal with because of its complexity. And um, it's probably one of the most complicated joints in our body because it's not just one joint, it's actually a, a girdle. There's four joints that move together. And so dealing with the shoulder from a surgical standpoint can be really tricky. And so I just wanted to share some of my experience with that. Are we? You ready for me to start? Yeah, dive right in. Go for it. Okay, let me uh, let me get my get my slides up and running. So I wanted to talk about uh, shoulder syndrome uh, because it's one of the most common diagnoses that we hear uh, for people as they age. And we're going to go through a review of the causes, treatment, and discuss some of the science behind it. Uh, I first started really thinking about shoulder impingement syndrome when I was a fellow at uh, UCLA. A fellow is someone who's subspecializing. So I'd already done three years of undergrad, four years of medical school, a year of internship, five years of residency, six months of a special uh, uh, of a fellowship in shoulders in St. Mike's. And now I'm down at UCLA furthering my knowledge. And oh my gosh, what an unbelievable experience it was. Like I spent probably three quarters of my time at the UCL, UCLA Surgery Center. And then the other part of my time, I was either standing on the sidelines of the Rose Bowl or uh, at the Poly Pavilion. Uh, unfortunately, John Wooden wasn't there anymore. That would have been like such a gas if he was there because he was just such an amazing basketball coach and not just a, an amazing basketball coach, but teacher, you know, principles of great mindset. Talk about great mindset. Um, so when I was there, um, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Harvard Elman, who was really a pioneer in shoulder arthroscopy. And uh, he wasn't actually at the UCLA Surgery Center. He was over at Cedar sinai And um, we only had one car at that time. So I would ride my bike and it was probably about five miles and it was up and down hills. And meanwhile, I was pregnant. And actually my very last day, um, in the OR, I remember riding my bike to watch Dr. Elman do a shoulder surgery. And I had a hard time. I, I was going up the hills and getting contractions and kind of coasting down and, you know, they were everything relaxing. And so I remember one of the equipment rep guys gave me a ride home um, in his truck. He threw my bike in the back and, and my son Joshua was born. And I put this picture up because actually in the back corner here is a journal of shoulder and elbow surgery. So I was trying to kind of do a little reading, but um, they didn't actually have a maternity leave in those days. So I got four weeks of my vacation and then they gave me one extra week because it was tough. You know, they call it labor for a reason, but I, I really loved the shoulder and was quite fascinated with this shoulder impingement syndrome. Uh, so what is shoulder impingement? Uh, it's important that we distinguish it uh, as a diagnosis versus a syndrome. So it, shoulder impingement syndrome is a constellation of symptoms. Mainly it's pain over the anterior or front of the shoulder and the lateral aspect of the shoulder that is aggravated by repetitive movement, particularly activities at or above shoulder height. And it often starts very slowly and progressively where you just start to notice some pain and you may notice pain reaching into the back seat of your car or putting your hand in your back pocket. And, um, and then the pain gets to the point where it interferes with your sleep at night and, and can get really, really, really uh, um, bad. Uh, 
the cause of this is basically, if we look at this anatomy picture on the far left of your screen, there's the humeral head, which articulates with the glenoid, which is sits on the shoulder blade. And uh, here is the acromion, and then this is the clavicle or collarbone. What happens as we raise our arm up, the rotator cuff muscle, the supraspinatus with its muscle and then the tendon here are responsible for keeping that ball centered on the saucer as the deltoid pulls our arm up overhead. And as we get to around 60 degrees, the humeral head can um, abut or the tendon there can abut against the acromion and that pinches it or impinges the tendon. Now, initially when this starts out, you, the tendon is normal, but if you keep doing this over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you can actually tear the tendon. So this is an arthroscopic view of a shoulder. Uh, we can see the articular cartilage from the humeral head. That's the round humeral head there. And then this is the rotator cuff tendon, the supraspinatus, and this is normal. If you go look at the right side here, you can see the humeral head and then look at this, there's a hole. And so one of the um, problems that can happen if you have recurrent impingement and impingement pain over many years is you can eventually wear a hole in the rotator cuff tendon. Now today we are mainly focusing on rotator cuff impingement syndrome without a rotator cuff tear. Okay, and so there's quite a difference in my mind as a surgeon when I'm approaching a patient for, with someone who has a tear and someone who doesn't have a tear. So how do you know if you have a tear? Well, have a look at this, uh, these phones. And if you can tell me what your, put in the chat here, what was your very first phone? We got to the far left. If, you, or if you're number one, I wanna know what your secret to life longevity is because you're gonna be a little older. What um, is that? What is that on number one? I have no idea what that is. Well, that's a phone. You, it, it's, um... <laughs> oh, that's a phone? That's a phone. Yeah, okay. you pick, I think my grandmother might have had one up at the farm, but you actually you pick up. So you pick up the little you pick up this this little handle. Okay. You put that to your ear and then you speak into this. This is a speaker. And okay. usually it was a party line. I remember my grandma had a party line. And so there's probably people would sit in their kitchen and they'd just be listening to uh, everybody in the neighborhood talking about whatever. Well, so then fun. we have a we have a rotary phone. Now, I actually, there's a rotary phone that's a little more modern than that. And that actually was my first phone was a rotary phone. Then, um, then we have like um, just a, a, a mobile phone that, you know, has to sit in its charger and then the flip phone, then the Blackberry. So as we're going over to the right and then our smartphones, um, you're going to, if your first phone is a smartphone, you're pretty young. Um, actually, I don't know how old kids are these days when they're getting phones, but Basically, if you are a BlackBerry user or a smartphone user as your very first phone, because I've seen all of these phones uh, as your very first phone, then you likely are just in the normal rotator cuff uh, to possibly some tendinosis partial tearing. But as we go over in age, so once you get into your 40s, 50s and above, then the rotator cuff changes from tendinosis to a partial thickness tear, and then eventually a full thickness tear. So age is one of the most common determinants uh, with regards to uh, your propensity to having a rotator cuff tendon tear. Lots of number twos for that, that, is, that question right. there, Doc. Rotary. The, the rotary phone, what's the number? Number oh. twos. Oh, the number in twos? The, yeah, in the chat there. Um, that would, the number twos would be closer to partial thickness, possible full thickness tears. So that would be your, your kind of 60s, 70s and above. Okay. So as a surgeon, when we started looking at impingement, we're always looking at structure. And this is why I love working with Eric because he looks at function and I, you know, I admit I started to look at function, but he's taken it all to another level, which I love. So we look at the structure, we've got the humeral head, we've got the glenoid, we've got this muscle and the tendon, and here's the acromion. So this is the subacromial space. And if we look at it from the side, as surgeons, what we did is we, we sort of identified this supraspinatus outlet. Now I'm gonna try, to, I'm gonna try something new here. 
I don't know this, Eric did it last week. That's not the new thing I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, draw a little picture. So when we look at the, um, when we look at the um, acromion, what can happen is that over time you can develop a little spur here on the front of the acromion. And there is a ligament called the coracoacromial ligament, which goes between the acromion and the coracoid process. And so as surgeons, what we did is we looked at this space here and we called it the supraspinatus outlet because the supraspinatus muscle and tendon is in this area. Now, if, if um, you look at the angle here of the acromion, you can see that this is sort of parallel to the humeral head. And we identified different shapes uh, of the acromion. So if the acromion was a little bit more horizontal, you can see that there's less space. So the whole purpose of our surgery to deal with subacromial impingement was to actually make the space bigger. So if you had the spur here on the acromion, we go in arthroscopically, we remove the spur. If you had a different shape of the acromion, we, we, we couldn't really change that, but we could try to increase the space again by, um, by removing a portion of the acromion and sometimes the end of the clavicle. So that's what we're thinking as surgeons and how we could possibly fix uh, subacromial impingement. Uh, but how good at this were we? Well, I came across this article, this is a couple of years old now, but I really wanted to share it with everybody because it's still fairly common um, as a procedure. And this is an article again out of Finland. The guys in, uh, I, I think they're fantastic in, their, in the way that they look at, at uh, problems. And they performed uh, a study where they looked at arthroscopic subacromial decompression. So that's the removal of that bone spur on the acromion to try and increase the space versus a diagnostic arthroscopy. So they would just put the scope in the shoulder and they randomized the patients into one of two groups. And they had 210 patients. And at the time of the surgery, if they found that the person had a full thickness rotator cuff tear or another pathology that needed surgery, they eliminated them from the group. So it were two groups who basically had a normal rotator cuff, possible very small partial tear. So these would be most likely people that are 40, 50 years of age. And they found that there was no difference after two years, whether or not you'd had the acromion removed or not. And then they had a third group, which couldn't be blinded, but a group that had no surgery whatsoever and just did exercises. And they found that initially the two surgical, surgical uh, groups, so whether you had just the sham surgery or whether you had the arthroscopic sub subacromial decompression, had less pain than the exercise group, but at two years, the pain was about equal and the function was the same. So why would that be? And I really got thinking about this a lot because I deal with athletes all the time and you wanna have people who are able to function and perform. And so when you think about how the shoulder girdle works together, it's not just this glenoid and humeral head. And you can see here the supraspinatus tendon as the uh, arm abducts, the supraspinatus holds the uh, humeral head into position centered on the glenoid. But you can also see that after about 60 degrees of abduction, this scapula or our shoulder blade has to move. So there are other joints that are involved in the motion of our shoulder girdle. And it's not just this isolated area of the glenohumeral joint itself. And we have the uh, sternoclavicular joint. You can actually just put your finger in the notch here. And as you raise your arm up, you can feel the clavicle um, moving. And so I started thinking, you know, if we are just doing surgery to increase the space, the subacromial space, we're not addressing a number of other factors that actually influence functionally how the rotator cuff is potentially impinged. 
And so if you have head forward posture with thoracic kyphosis, then you're likely going to have a poor position of your scapula. Your scapula will be tilted anteriorly or to the front. And this immediately limits the range of motion that you have in your shoulder. And if you try to lift higher with your arm, you end up impinging the rotator cuff. So doing an arthroscopic subacromial decompression or just doing rotator cuff strengthening exercises is not going to change your head forward posture and the position of your scapula. So you need to address these two components that are root causes of shoulder impingement. There's also a very important uh, aspect, and this is posterior shoulder tightness. And I would see this particularly in overhead athletes, but it can happen in anybody who has shoulder impingement. And you can test this on yourself. If you stand up against a wall so that you don't let your shoulder blade move, you can bring your arm in front of your body. And I actually, because of tennis, have some tightness on my right shoulder compared to the left. You, you move to see if you can bring your elbow in front of your body. And if you have this posterior capsular tightness, I can guarantee that you're going to develop shoulder impingement at some point because the tightness at the base and the back of your shoulder leads to the humeral head rising up and pinching against the acromion. So you cannot eliminate the impingement until you fix the posterior capsular tightness. And it's the most common reason that I would see that people would fail non-surgical treatment for impingement syndrome. And the other common um, little caveat or, or trick that I've, I've seen over the years is patients who are under the age of 30. Um, they have problems of a dynamic impingement related more to a very loose capsule and instability. So anybody with hypermobility, we've talked about this before. If you can touch your thumb to your forearm, which I cannot, uh, if you take your hand and you bring your finger and your finger points straight up to the ceiling, that's hypermobile. If you have hyperextension of your elbow, that's hypermobility. If you have hyperextension of your knees, that's hypermobility. And if you can put your hands flat on the floor with your knees straight, uh, that's hypermobility. If you have all of those signs, then you likely have a component of laxity in your shoulder. And if the rotator cuff muscles go to sleep and the shoulder is kind of rattling around, then you can stress the rotator cuff tendons and pinch them. So if we think about going in and doing a surgery to remove a spur and increasing the space for the rotator cuff tendon, it can give a little bit of benefit. It gives a little, takes a little bit of the squeeze off the tendon, but it's not gonna fix the primary problem. We need to have a more mobile thoracic spine and improve our head forward posture. We have to make sure that the muscles around our shoulder blade, our scapular stabilizers, primarily serratus and the lower trap, are working in concert with the rotator cuff muscle tendon units. We have to eliminate the posterior capsular tightness. It doesn't matter how much you try to strengthen your rotator cuff, you won't be able to do it effectively until you've eliminated posterior capsular tightness. And you have to make sure that your cuff is on and activated when you're moving. So that's my take on impingement syndrome. And um, I think we've got a, we've got a, a lot of great videos that Eric has done that we can share to teach you how to actively release your posterior capsular tightness, how to um, get the coordination between your scapula and your scapular humeral rhythm. And I know, uh, Eric, I'd love to hear you talk on this, <laughs> but the, the whole shoulder blades down and back uh, issue with shoulder impingement and really how important mm. the mobility of the scapula is in preventing impingement. Yeah, that's one of the kind of, I term them movement myths, but one of the big movement myths in the fitness industry that I found, I heard it from people um, that I'd work with. Tons of people have emailed me about it because I called it out. Um, and it's basically the cue is pinch the shoulder blades down and back through all the movements, exercise that you do, like pull-ups, you keep them down and back the whole time. And you're doing the pull-ups like that or overhead presses, set your shoulder blades, put them in your back pocket. People, coaches use different terms and keep them there as you press up overhead. Uh, that cue has been abused uh, because what's missing is the nuance and the fact that 
the scapula, the shoulder blade has to move as your arm goes up for all the reasons that you just described in the presentation there. If you don't do that, if your shoulder blades are set in one position, especially down and back, when you're lifting the arms up overhead, whatever it is you're doing, uh, that's causing impingement, squeezing on the tendon or the bursa, and there's going to be uh, hell to pay over if you keep doing that years and years. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of people email me. I call it out in the scap strength program and the shoulder control course. Uh, I've got an article on it on the website, but I've had people email me saying, yeah, I've, I've torn my rotator cuff because I was doing that. And now that I've learned the difference, things feel so much better. I'm able to go up overhead and do things, exercises, or just reach up in the cupboard without pain. Uh, because they're training that scapula to move, which opens the space up for the tendon and the bursa as you outlined. No, oh, that's great. That's awesome. So have you ever had shoulder impingement? I've thankfully, I, yeah, my, my shoulders have been pretty good. Uh, you know how to use them. That's why. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, even, well, luckily as a kid, I, I never, I, I played, um, played fastball actually. So mm -hmm. in the summers I was the pitcher for fastball. And that's okay. where you do the, the windmill action. Uh -huh. And uh, I played a lot of other sports, but luckily I think it was just luck because I didn't know anything as a kid. I didn't run into any bad shoulder things. And then when I got into training, still, I didn't know what I was really doing at first when I got into weights when I was 16. Um, my, my program was bench press, bicep curls, and tricep extensions. Okay. Um, yeah. And thankfully, yeah, I didn't have anything there. But then I, when I started to learn stuff, obviously, I, I started to move better. No, that's really cool. And I think one of the advantages, you know, for any parents who are listening, and they've got their kids in sport, I think variety is really important, because I've seen a huge increase in shoulder problems uh, in younger people because of sport specificity and spe specialization. Uh, you get kids starting to play tennis and training at the age of four. By the time they're 15, they've put in, you know, 10, 11 years of high volume of activity. And, the, and particularly yeah. when they're going through the growth spurt, it's, it's, it's a challenge. But when you play lots of different sports, then you challenge the tissues uh, in many different ways. And this allows for them to be stretched differently and they remodel. And so the imbalances don't become so ingrained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. And maybe that's part of the, the reason I was always that's playing different sports. Awesome. When I was weight training, I was always playing a lot of different sports at the same time. So I was able to stretch and move and activate all the muscles uh, with those different patterns. Yes. All right. So uh, I think it's time for questions. And it seems like we've got a bunch flowing in already. Um, just a reminder, if you're going to... Hey, Kim. Just a reminder, if you're going to ask a question, please tell us your age, uh, be as concise as you can. And for the love of God, frame it as a question, <laughs> please. It's so hard to decipher sometimes for me because I'm jumping back and forth. So just help me out. Come on, help me out a little bit. So uh, let's start off with Rachel, Rachel Carswell. Uh, she's 45 years old, no injuries, mostly got active about six years ago. Her question is, I'm still experiencing a bit, a bit of pain and lack of ROM when I reach across myself, so horizontal uh, flexion there, like the woman in the image. The pain is right in the junction of the glenohumeral joint and humerus. Various practitioners have called it biceps tendonitis. Uh, will there be something in shoulder control or in one of the other programs that will help me address this? Discouraging because everything else seems to be improving, but this just isn't. So this issue, the pain doing this guy, I know Doc, you can break this one down. So the pain uh, there, that, that can, um, A, if she has tightness there, that could be an indication she has posterior capsular tightness, which will cause the humeral head to go forward and you get a pinch both in the, potentially in the biceps or the AC joint. But the, the key thing here is to get that posterior capsule release because it's very challenging to strengthen the rotator cuff effectively if every time you go to move, the humeral head has this obligatory upward motion and it pinches the supraspinatus and the long head of biceps. So you've got to eliminate that motion by balancing the shoulder first. And that's why Eric and I always talk about 
the four R's where you have to relax the tissue. Yeah, so one. improve the tissue pliability. Then you restore the proper movement patterns and establish strength through end range. Then you put it all together by reprogramming a movement pattern. Um, it's also, if you've had a, if you have a lot of tightness in the biceps tendon uh, and the coracobrachialis, so you could have quite an anterior tilt to the scapula, um, releasing the pec minor uh, will also be beneficial prior to doing your activation. So I always say do active self myofascial release of the posterior shoulder, the pec minor, and then you do your activation exercises and, and the shoulder control will be a great program for you. Yeah. And I think the, the other thing that might not be in there, if we, we got to get it in, um, is the active sleeper stretch for yep. the posterior capsule. That one is, uh, is huge. That's I'm what I learned from you. Falling. And it's, uh, it's been super helpful. So I gotta make, we got to make sure, use Josh, we got to make sure that that gets in the shoulder control program at the start there. And so, and so do that active self, or do the active sleeper stretch, Rachel, before you do your shoulder control program. And you'll notice a big difference in how things start to loosen up and release. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody, as we answer your questions, if you have any follow-up questions or comments, leave them in the chat and we'll circle back. So next up, we have Francine. Can C4 and 5 be responsible for shoulder impingement? What treatment or therapy would you recommend to fix? You can definitely have pain that radiates from the neck into the shoulder. And this is actually going to be a topic in a couple of weeks that I'd like to um, address because I've just personally had to deal with the whole thing. And uh, it's more common at C5, 6 and C4, 5, but the nerve roots that come out from your neck, uh, you know, the C5, 6, 7, these nerve roots supply the muscles around your shoulder girdle that if you pinch or put pressure on those nerves, then it can cause pain that radiates out into the shoulder girdle. And the key here is to correct the head forward posture by correcting the thoracic kyphosis. And um, I found in my case that I had a lot of tightness around the first rib. And if we look at the anatomy of the serratus anterior muscle, there are horizontal fibers that go from the upper medial border of your scapula to the first rib. And those can get very tight and kind of hold your scapula and prevent it from moving the way it needs to move. And so that's a very important area to do some self myofascial release. You can get your fingers in around your, uh, your, the base of your neck and your shoulder blade, and just even doing shoulder circles, uh, turning your head to the side and moving. Um, I found actually with the scap strength program that really helped me a lot with the what do you, wait, what's the name of the exercise? It's the Cobra where you're like, you're in the Cobra position and then you do some yeah. movement of your curious neck. Cobra curious. That's it. Curious Cobra. I like yeah. that. Cause so that actually really helped me to turn the corner. Um, I cool. find that a lot of the neck pain in that can often radiate more into the back of the shoulder blade and the infraspinatus can be affected, but um, releasing around your neck, doing the Curious Cobra, doing the hunchback routine. Um, Eric's got great videos on that. Um, will really help you a lot in, in then allowing you to strengthen your rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one I was just going through for, because I was going through a warm up for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu um, athletes. And I was going through some exercises and that one is a part of that just because of um, their necks get cranked so badly. Uh, they got to warm it up. Otherwise they, they, a lot of guys, I know a lot of guys who've suffered from a lot of serious neck issues from jujitsu. So it's an area that they definitely need to, to prioritize when it comes to mobility and, and stability more, more importantly is stability. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was Francine, I believe. Um, so yeah, mobilize, we posted a couple links and we just a reminder, we have use and Josh in the back here taking care of business. So they're posting links and making sure everything's organized. Uh, they've posted a couple of links to routines. Uh, one is the, the posterior shoulder capsule, which is the active sleeper stretch that's on YouTube. And then there's a mention of some routines in ROM coach, upper body posture one and neck restoration one, where you can get this stuff worked out. Uh, if you got the app, just fire up those routines. 
I, I use both of those routines regularly because I find just sitting at the computer, driving, and my tennis, and just mm. years of having head forward posture, and it's making a massive difference. I'm really excited. <laughs> well, surgery always down in, oh, yeah. in the in the body there, the chop hunchback. it away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plus, being six foot tall, uh, that probably contributes it to that a little bit too. Definitely does. Yeah, and then operating with the belly because you're pregnant, <laughs> that probably even further exacerbates it. That was a challenge sometimes. We had a lot of fun in the OR. Actually, it was hysterical because, you know, we, it, it's not a big space, you know, and the, when the baby started kicking and the guys are feeling it, they're like, what the hell's that? <laughs> like, that's the baby. They're, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so it reminds me of Alien, the movie yeah. Alien. Yes. Alien emerges. Don't want that happening during surgery. <laughs> uh, Okay, I just wanted to uh, actually share because this is something that I know you talk about a lot and a lot of people miss when it comes to uh, dealing with shoulder impingement. They're always looking at the shoulder. You know, we're, we're focused on the, the site of the pain, but I'm just gonna pull this one up. This is a little testimonial um, or a comment, I guess, on YouTube. And this is for this video. It's the hunchback video. We just talked about it. This is Dante. He's, mentioning I have thoracic kyphosis for over 10 years now. Uh, he's, he's been considering surgery for kyphosis because his physio had consisted of stretching and no longer gave results. And he found this and fired up the muscles that I talk about. It's this video right here. Um, wake up this hidden muscle where I talk about the anatomy and just help you visualize what's going on inside and what we're trying to do there. But he was saying that he did the exercise and afterwards his body felt so light and it became so easy to breathe. And for the first time in four years, he ran 10K, which is pretty cool. So uh, this exercise, it just helps you to open up, extend the thoracic spine, but not like your traditional foam roller extension where you're passively over top of it or like over top of the edge of my chair here, same kind of idea. It actively brings you into that position and doing so will help you to get there and to help your body to stay there. Because you get there actively, your brain allows you to stay there because it perceives stability in that area and it makes life easier and it will help with shoulder impingement. So if there's, you know, for thoracic spine, if you could only do one exercise, uh, do this exercise, get good at it. It'll take a little bit of practice because you're trying to wake up muscles that maybe haven't been worked for years or at least haven't been worked properly for, for a long time and it, it'll take a while it's uh but once you get it going the, the activation things that's once you get the activation type of thing going like the exercises that activate muscles that haven't been working once you do it the first time after that it's so much easier and then you can just strengthen 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 until you're up nice and tall effortlessly because that's what posture should be you shouldn't be focused on it and straining to hold it all day that's not going to work that's just going to constipate you you should be effortless. You should be aligned, nice and tall, breathe easy. Um, that's what posture is all about. So I just wanted to share that little comment and make sure people who haven't done that exercise or haven't seen that video, go over there afterwards and uh, check that out. Okay, so let's go back to the Q&A. This is from Meadows, Golf and Barbecue. Sounds like a place I'd like to visit. Yeah. Uh, 62 years old. How can I best regain strength and ROM in my surgically repaired shoulders? Bicipital tendon, bicep tendons have been surgically cut, supraspinatus tendon reattached, and AC joint bone spurs removed. Okay, so um, the best thing to do here is to actually not focus that much on your shoulder joint, like the biceps and the rotator cuff, but to do all the things that we've talked about, get the hunchback under control. So check out Eric's uh, video that we've just put up. Make sure that your posterior capsule is loose. That's really important. And, um, and then do gentle activation exercises for the rotator cuff so that you're engaging all of them. You no longer have the uh, long head of biceps, which is an important uh, tendon to kind of keep that humeral head lower in, in the shoulder socket and keep it aligned. So the remaining rotator cuff uh, muscle tendon units are critical. So 
Yes, you do some exercises to strengthen and activate the rotator cuff, but you need to really make sure that your scapula is in good position, your thoracic spine is mobile, and that the scapular humeral rhythm, so that meaning that your shoulder blade is able to work with the rotator cuff effectively. And I, Eric, maybe you'd comment on that. I find that the serratus is just a, you know, one of those top, top three or four neglected muscles in the body. Uh, and sure. a real challenge, a real challenge for people with shoulder problems because they, you know, they get tipped forward and mm -hmm. I don't think that the serratus is functioning well in that upper portion, the horizontal bit, I think gets really short and tight uh, along with the pec minor. And I think that the most powerful way to remodel your body is actively, you know, you mentioned it this just a, a minute ago with the foam rolling and kind of arching your back over a foam roller versus doing the exercise that you teach in the hunchback video. There's a dramatic difference that I've observed for patients who actively move the scapula to lengthen the tissue versus people who just stretch. So in the scap strength program, I got to say, I loved all of the activation exercises in that warm up. They're mm. really important for anybody with a rotator cuff problem yeah yeah uh, um, and teaching of sort of that posterior tilt to the scapula uh, it, you do that really well i don't know maybe you want to do you want to kind of outline to people how they can do that just in their chair sitting and then opening or um yeah this i mean i think the probably the best would be to direct to uh there's a youtube video the straightest anterior exercises video okay. where i talk about that and then i give exercises a few different exercises because some work better. I found work better for others to get activation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it depends on people's kind of motor ability, movement learning ability. So uh, yeah, let's direct people to that video and they Perfect. can check that out after. So start off with the hunchback exercise, then do the serratus exercise after we wrap the show today. And uh, that'll get you going. But yeah, that's definitely the serratus. Any of the muscles that are deep are muscles that are neglected. I found like, so serratus is very deep. It's sitting on the, the anterior aspect of the scapula, which is, you know, if you're looking at the back, it's behind the bone of the shoulder blade. If you're looking at somebody from the back, so it's, you can't touch it. Can't really see it too well. Um, so it gets neglected. It's like, it's wasn't a part of my 16 year old weight training program. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for those superficial muscles to expand. Uh, so, okay, let's go to Sherry. What do you think about acupuncture for my frozen shoulder? Love it. Just love it. Um, I took an acupuncture course. Oh gosh. It's like 15, 20 years ago. And I was really amazed um, at the power of it. I, there was a, there's a, an acupuncture point called GV 24.5 and it's just on a little ridge here between your eyes. And we were practicing on each other. And uh, one of the other students Put the needle in there and i just started laughing i was just like you know i was giggling i felt drunk not that i drank that much but um and the and the the instructor walks by and she goes oh that's the happy point and it was like i didn't know it as the happy point i knew it as gv 24.5 i'd learned like five million you know acupuncture points so i was struck by the physiologic effect of the acupuncture and I've had a lot of uh, patients who've had great success with treating frozen shoulder with acupuncture. It's not the all. It's not the only thing. It's a tool. Uh, when we think about the four R's, that's a tool to decrease pain, to help decrease inflammation, to change the biology of the cells that are in that frozen shoulder capsule. And we're trying to basically get the cells to go from freezing to thawing. And uh, when you're in that sort of horrible, I mean, and I'm sorry you're having this because it's a, one of the worst pains I think that I've, I hear people describe, but when you're in that horrible sort of freezing stage, treat your shoulder kindly, don't overstretch, but just do some gentle isometric activations, use hot, cold contrast, people generally feel better with heat and, and acupuncture can be a good tool. Well, cool. I've actually had a similar experience with acupuncture where I just really? started giggling like a little <laughs> schoolgirl. Um, it was funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was bizarre. Like I just, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I was kind of shocked and pleasantly surprised. You know, I love, I love mm. the fact that that happened. It's good. Yeah. yeah very cool. Uh, okay. So next up we have James Lincoln. 
and another gentleman, Rob Bartlett, are both talking about clicking and grinding. Um, not with each other, but with their shoulders are, are clicking and grinding. My question is, this is James. <laughs> my question is, how can I stop getting clicking in my shoulder? Because every time I raise my arm, I hear a loud click. So I want to stop getting the bad clicking. My ROMs are good. It's just I have this issue where I hear lots of clicking and inflammation, and it hurts sometimes. I'm 18, and I do arm wrestling now. Got this injury from too much bench press and push-ups and not enough sleep. Uh, because I'm in high school, and there's no recovery for the next workout. <laughs> OK. Um, so clicking, in, it's common for shoulders to click. And I don't really worry about it too much, so long as it's not painful. And, but what's sort of jumping out at me is a younger person who is doing weights, uh, I would really be focusing on activating your rotator cuff so that you're keeping that glenohumeral joint centrated when you go to do heavier weights. If you're having the dynamic impingement, uh, you can then create an inflammatory reaction in the bursa and you will feel clicking and hear clicking and your shoulder can become painful. So. Again, though, you've got to also, we always have to go back to the thoracic spine because it starts there. So good thoracic spine mobility, good scapular humeral rhythm, and make sure that your rotator cuff is activated before you do your weights. Cool. And then Rob is saying that his clicking and grinding occurs when his arm goes above horizontal while externally rotated. So external rotation. Okay above horizontal. And I can also pull my arm and feel it partially subluxus. Touching my rotator cuff also hurts very badly. It's been going on for about three months and then resting hasn't really helped. So uh, that's interesting because um, usually impingement pain is when your arm is internally rotated because the greater tuberosity where the supraspinatus sits is sort of the larger part of the humeral head. And as you internally rotate it, you bring it under that coracromial arch. And that's where the impingement occurs. But the fact that you've said that you feel like your shoulder is subluxing makes me think that you've got a similar uh, problem of a little bit of looseness in the shoulder. And that's why with external rotation, it's, it's still bothersome because you've created inflammation potentially in the bursa um, because the shoulder is kind of just very rattling around. It's, it's micro, you know, millimeters. We're not talking, it, it could go out of course, but it's probably just millimeters of motion which is overstressing the tissues and creating inflammation. So you need to follow the same advice that we've talked about here with uh, already. And, and it should make a big difference for you. Yeah, and three months of rest, um, you don't need to rest anymore. If, that's, if there was something that was going to be healed through resting alone, it would have been healed by now. So it's time to get activated, um, get the, the tissue pliability going through. The four R's, as we discuss, uh, if you want to just get a program that outlines it all, it's shoulder control, where mm -hmm. you start in phase one with basic exercises for activation and tissue pliability, and then work your through, way through three phases uh, that get progressively more challenging as you go. So that's what I would recommend for you. And, and I agree also, Eric, that you know, when you rest, this is such a common thing I hear. People take time off from their sport or their activity. They start feeling better. As soon as they go back to their activity, their pain recurs. It's because they haven't rebalanced their body. They haven't corrected the thoracic kyphosis. They haven't activated the scapular stabilizers. So it's just you start the process all over again of overloading the tissue. And each time and each decade, it gets harder to fix the problem, but it can still be fixed, even when you're as old as I am. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're old saying, don't stop moving, change how you move. That's, yes, it's critical. Yeah. yeah. So Rob, hopefully that helps get you on the right path there. Uh, next up, we have Chrysanth, our friend Chrysanth. What causes jumpy catching shoulders and what could help smooth the motion out? It's not exactly cracking or popping, it's something quieter. I feel it when I shrug the shoulders, do scap circles, that kind of thing. So, so Chrysanth, that could actually be your shoulder blades um, moving against your ribs. Uh, there's a bursa. That's a, just a, a thin fluid filled sac that normally isn't inflamed at all. But if you have some imbalance in the way the serratus and the lower and the traps are working together or not working together, 
then the scapula can get pushed against the, um, the chest wall and create that kind of grinding feeling. Um, I had it when I was actually rebalancing that upper portion of the serratus. When I got into a certain position, I could actually feel a little clunk kind of up in the uh, deep uh, underneath my shoulder blade. So it's usually, if it's not painful, it's tissue remodeling. Um, and there are very rare causes where you can have like a benign little bump called an osteochondroma on the undersurface of your scapula. You know, in my 30 years of shoulder surgery, I've, I've seen one. So that's not common. It's much more likely to be the movement pattern and how you're moving. So um, I would go slowly through the area of the motion. And uh, if it's not painful, I would just monitor it and maybe lessen the contraction, play with the intensity of the contraction and be aware, just really be aware of, of the position of the tilt of your scapula and adjust that as you can to see how that feels. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I do get some clicking and grinding as well when I do the, the scapular circle, especially when I'm protracted and I'm going through like that part of the motion mm -hmm. right about there. Mm -hmm, I get mm -hmm. some, some of the popping and sometimes there's a little clunk, but I've been doing these circles pretty intensely for quite a while now. And I haven't had any, like I never had any pain and I still haven't any issues. So sometimes, sometimes if there is pain for sure, be aware of it and, and do something about it. But if there's no pain, it's just a little unnerving. And I think you'll you'll be okay for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, okay, next up we have Chaz. I'm 70. When I do a side plank on my right shoulder, I feel a grunching, like G-R-A-U-N-C-H-I-N-G. -G. That grunching. doesn't sound good. No, that does not sound good at <laughs> that all. That sounds like surgery. <laughs> <laughs> like the joint is moving and enough pain to make me stop. I've started shoulder control. Will this help or what else? Other insights? Yes, I think it would help for sure, because it's most likely how your shoulder blade is positioned and the mobility of your thoracic spine that's compromising how your rotator cuff can stabilize the shoulder joint itself. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to do a side plank, lessen the load to just go to your knees. And if you can do that without pain, then that's okay. But you ideally want to fix the primary problem in your upper back and around your shoulder girdle before you use side plank and maybe do a different exercise to achieve the goal until your shoulder, your shoulder girdle is a little healthier. Yeah. There's a lot of weight that goes through the shoulder in a side plank. So if you can imagine I'm here and I'm side planking, if you don't have strong muscles and good stability through the shoulder joint, it just does that. The head of the humerus just gets jammed in that way. And that's probably causing some of that grunching. Um, so when you, you get stronger, you're able to hold it, out from being compressed so much. You got your lats on, you've got the rotator cuff on, all the muscles on virtually uh, of the shoulder to keep that stability so that you don't get that compression grinding of the tissues in the shoulder. So that I think will come, like Doc said, go to the knees, Just do it from the knees instead of the feet. That'll take some of the load off and where you can, and when you're doing it, make sure that you are actively kind of pressing your body away through the shoulder so you don't get crunched in that way. And that should help you to be able to do that without, without pain. Um, that's one position, just kind of a side note related. When you're on the ground, when I'm on the ground, this is something that I do just naturally because um, I'm a movement geek. But whenever I'm leaning on my hand, and I, I've noticed this, a lot of people, they lean on their hand, say I'm sitting on the ground, and then they get their shoulder and it just jams up in this direction because they're leaning back on it. Be active push down against the ground so that your shoulder isn't hiked up into your, your ear passively and just stretching out the tissues, compressing tissues, but be active, get those muscles on to push yourself away from the floor. And that'll just keep your, your shoulders healthier. It's one of those little things that you don't necessarily think is, has an impact um, until you have pain. And then you realize, oh, okay, I'm just getting all compressed and that hurts. But when I do this, it's okay. So I'm going to start doing that. Just push yourself away. Don't let joints get compressed and misaligned. Uh, it's a little thing, but something that might be able to help, especially if you're already feeling some kind of issues in the shoulder and you do sit on the ground a bunch. I'm always on the ground because I got my kids there. and uh, It's easy to, to wrangle them when I'm down there. Okay, next up, uh, 
quick time check. It's 12.55. I could go till about 1.10 today. Got some stuff to cover uh, afterwards, Doc. So I need you and I need your time. So okay. I'm sorry, folks. I'm going to have to pull Dr. B away from the, the YouTube. But uh, we got about 15 minutes left. So we're going to fly through as many questions as we can. If we don't get to your question, please come back next week. We've got a good track record of showing up here for the most part. So please come back next week, noon Eastern Daylight Time, EDT. Um, I didn't know there's a difference between EDT and EST until we I missed a meeting with somebody who's in a different time zone. <laughs> but that's okay. Lesson learned. So noon next week on Thursday and come back with your questions. So we'll try to get to you there. Next up, we have D. Gillis. How about dips? What should be the scapular position? Okay, uh, I'll just jump into this one. Dips, scapular position is kind of neutral. And then as, this is what I like to do, kind of neutral. As you go down, you start to retract. And then you stop once this stuff starts to happen. Once the whole shoulder girdle starts to round forward, you're no longer moving through the place where you want to move through, which is the glenohumeral joint. You're starting to tilt the scapula forward anteriorly, which is going to cause some impingement issues. So with dips, you're going to have to cut your range probably, but go down, 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 down. That's my range there, my active range into shoulder extension. Any more that I go is going to come from rounding my spine. And it looks like I'm getting deeper, but I'm not actually getting deeper. So be really diligent, retract the scapula. This is where you can pinch them back together. And then once you get to your end active range of shoulder extension, shoulder extension is this motion, arm going behind you. Once you get there, stop, come back up. To so work within your active range of motion for dips. Otherwise it's gonna irritate all the stuff that we just talked about with respect to shoulder impingement today. Okay, Jamie, Jamie the rooster. Can a broken collarbone cause posture or shoulder issues if it does not heal in line? Yes, it can. Um, there can be some scarring because of the bleeding from the fractured bone. Um, and the tissues kind of the muscles and the nerves and everything can kind of get a little adherent to the, the um, fib fibrous tissue and the callus as the bone is healing. It depends a little bit on the position that your fracture has healed in. There's some people that just have a fracture and the bone heals perfectly anatomically. And then there's other people where there's actual shortening of the clavicle and that will change the mechanics of your shoulder. Uh, but all you can do in those situations is really focus. And in fact, it's probably more important to focus on all the little things that we've talked about today, head forward posture, releasing uh, in fact, the curious cobra would be one exercise that you would do what I, that I would really imagine you would feel something because the neck muscles as they insert onto your clavicle or collarbone will have been affected by the, the fracture and they may get stuck and then you can't move your, your scapula and your neck, keep them properly aligned. So that will help to remodel. And I think that one of the, the point that Eric just made about moving through your range where you can keep good technique is such an important point. So actively move through maybe a, a shorter range of motion as you're healing or if, again, trying to remodel and improve tissue pliability is important. And you just push slightly more each week. You'll gain range depending on how uh, fibrotic the tissue is. The less fibrotic, the more pliable the tissue, the faster that things will return to normal. But if you've got some really stiff fibrotic tissue in there, that needs, uh, it needs a lot of uh, sort of gentle attention and slow and steady um, by actively stressing the tissue will lead to changes and improvement in range of motion. So yeah. I think that the, the shoulder control program could be a very good one uh, to, to help with the recovery uh, in, in this situation. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree there. And uh, the other neck one that I like that releases that tissue is just the wall neck side bend. Mm -hmm. So you get on the wall, back to the wall, head to the wall, and then just breathe out and then breathe in as you come up. And this is another active lengthening of these tissues. It's not just me pulling on my head and stretching there, but I'm actively firing up these muscles to bring my ear to the shoulder. And then it's relaxing and lengthening these muscles on this side. So that's a great technique too. One of my favorites for relaxing the the next stuff that can often get tight. 
Okay, so this is another shoulder. What should I do about adhesive capsulitis? I'm just gonna say we need to do, you need to do a presentation on frozen <laughs> shoulder. Um, For sure. Yeah, that's, we've gotten this question a bunch now. I think there's a couple other ones down below here that I see. So for all the frozen shoulders out there, um, Dr. B will do up a presentation uh, relatively soon at some point, but uh, make sure you're subscribed to the channel because you'll get a little notification there on YouTube when that goes live. And also, I think I answered something on frozen shoulder a few weeks ago, just in the chat. And I, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly where it is, but we have timestamps so you could go back and look at it. And then we'll, because it's a really challenging uh, a problem and, and uh, I've had lots of experience and we'll give you lots of good tips. Mm -hmm. It will get better. That's the one thing. Just know that today. Nice. Yeah. If, user Josh, if you guys could pull up the, the live show, it was either two weeks ago or maybe three weeks ago. Can't remember exactly, but yeah, it was recent. Okay. Um, Jazzy B, I'm 21 and I've struggled with shoulder problems, impingement, weakness of scapula. Can't do push ups or any training. Recently told T spine mobility is bad. How long does it take to fix mobility? Well, for a 21 year old with the right stuff, it's pretty quick. I agree. Yeah, it'll go quick. The exercise, the hunchback exercise that we have a link for, that'll help. Um, with the ROM coach app, just going through all that stuff, the assess, go through the movement age assessment, do your daily movement tune ups. Uh, that's a good start. So being young, you have the benefit of uh, your tissues are, and being only 21. Your, your body's still kind of growing and, and it's easier to make changes at this point. So compared to us, us old folk <laughs> over here, we have to work so much harder. Um, so, but put in the work, I mean, in a couple of months, you'll, you'll be feeling drastically different. For sure. And if there's some, like if I, I didn't, didn't catch if he had like a real thoracic kyphosis, like it could be like a Schuerman's or something if there's a congenital anomaly that's affecting the alignment of your spine, doing all the exercises to prevent it from deteriorating and keeping your muscles turned on is critically important. So uh, you'll feel really good. Okay, next up, Kike. I had arthroscopic surgery to fix anterior labral tear four years ago. I was told that my ER was gonna be limited because of the surgery. I have roughly 75 to 80 degrees at 90, 90. Is that common? Very common. I would need to know actually what your other side is, uh, other range of motion compared because it's so variable uh, between individuals. Um, but having an anterior, anterior labral repair, often the capsule is shortened a bit. So that will uh, limit that mobility. Um, but again, if you focus on all of the other um, range of motion, like making sure your scapula is in a good position, making your, sure your thoracic spine is mobile, it makes a huge difference in how you can function. So for example, if you're missing external rotation, if you can extend through your thoracic spine, that's gonna increase the range where your hand can go and take a lot of the pressure off your anterior capsule. So you don't need to necessarily have that range uh, and stress your surgical repair. You'll get the extension through the thoracic spine and through the posterior tilt of your scapula. But if you don't know how to posteriorly tilt your scapula and you don't know how to extend your thoracic spine, then that'll really stress the shoulder repair. So I would really focus on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the exercises, the hunchback exercise and the serratus anterior exercises uh, we have here on YouTube, those would be super helpful. Okay, I'm Ali Vayuk, bicep tendonitis. I'm 42, had sub decompression four weeks ago and it's healing well in physio and so far so good however it seems i have slight bicep tendonitis where the shoulder is how long does that usually heal well you're pretty early after the surgery um so it usually takes about six weeks for the acute inflammation to settle down and i'm always hoping that my patients have a near normal range of motion at six weeks post-surgery then you start getting more aggressive with strengthening and um uh uh, through the range of motion and pushing your end range. I, I, at your stage, I would be focusing a lot on my thoracic spine and my scapular mobility because that actually doesn't affect the biceps tendon. And so you can get a step, of the, step ahead by doing scap circles, 
by doing, you, you may not be able to lean and go on all fours for the um, thoracic extension, but you can do the thoracic uh, end range expansion sitting in a chair. And um, so I would modify things that way uh, until you've gotten a little bit uh, further along in your post-surgery recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Work on the T-spine as you're recovering from the shoulder. Okay, next up is Donna. Hey, what's up, Donna? Um, this question about side sleeping. This question quite a bit. Is it normal to get shoulder impingement from sleeping on your side? I flip from one side to the other and find my right shoulder is especially sore some days. Shoulder pain at night is really common. And I don't know if it's the shoulder, it's sleeping on the shoulder that's causing the impingement or what you're doing throughout the day is leading to the painful shoulder at night because during the day shoulders, we often get away with not much pain. I think we're busy, everything's kind of working and kind of loose. And then when we get, we get to sleep at night and particularly then we lie on it and we get our head, especially I think at the neck alignment really changes um, the way that we feel with our shoulder. So I think that if you do the exercises that we've discussed today to improve the impingement situation, like improve your overall posture, uh, scapular mobility and stability, that your, your pain at night will settle down. Um, I would probably avoid sleeping on your side if you can. If you can't, make sure that your head is propped up so that, and your body is sort of propped up so that you're not really driving your shoulder into the, into the mattress and the bed. And, and of course, make sure you've got a nice supportive mattress where it's maybe not too hard uh, uh, and, and that can help a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the mattress is huge in this case because I've had issues when I was, just before I retired my old spring mattress that I had for probably two decades, um, I, was, I, was, I noticed some issues in especially my back, but a little bit in the shoulder. But then once we went to the memory foam mattress that we have now, uh, which I have an ND, ND memory foam mattress, it's a Canadian company, but that's made a huge difference. Like no back pain, no nothing from, I wake up amazing. Uh, so I never have any issues from, from my mattress. So that's big. And then the pillow, if you're a side sleeper, I have one of those curvy pillows and it's, I've got it for the right amount of height so that I'm not like this because uh, that could, any of those positions could be uh, irritating if you're in that position for like six, seven, eight hours, however you long, however long you sleep. So, yeah, I think uh, that makes a huge difference. I know Yusuf actually got an ND as well uh, mattress after I told him about it, and he said it's made a huge difference. So I love I love the memory foam. I can't imagine sleeping on anything else nowadays. Do you have a memory foam mattress? Or are you I, on I springs? Do. I, you I memory foam? No, no, I got a. Yeah, I'm with you. I. Like I, and actually I really made sure that I spoiled my kids with good, I, I think sleep is so important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you, if you don't have good sleep, then it's really tough to function and, and to deal with pain. For sure. Um, so JD has got a, a follow up on the sleep thing. What is the best arm position for sleep? How do you sleep? Do you sleep on the side or are you on the back? Oh, I'm all over the place. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm one of these, I'm like, I'm all over the place. Like I usually find yourself upside down, uh, kind of. head in the armpit, you know, like I'm just okay. kind of, I'm, I am all over the place. I, I, I think that lying on my back and trying to actually just extend everything and have everything aligned and relaxed. That's how I usually start out, <laughs> mm. but I invariably flip all of, I'm a mover uh, <laughs> <laughs> movement, longevity all night, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Always training, never day off. Yeah. It's, um, I, it depends on what's going on with your shoulder. If you have a really painful shoulder, a recliner chair is one of the godsends uh, because a little distraction for your shoulders really helps to release the pain. Uh, so often post-surgery, I would recommend to my patients that they rent a recliner or if they, had, if they didn't have one and, and sleep in a recliner chair with a pillow just so that your, your uh, arm is you know, around 45 degrees away from your body, but it's well-supported so the muscles can relax. If, um, if otherwise, um, I think you could raise your arm just up onto a little pillow, having your arm at about 40, 45 or 40 degrees, the ligaments are the loosest, uh, we call it the loose pack position. And so that there's no compression, what Eric was describing earlier, you know, if, when the shoulder or any joint is compressed, it's painful. So when you lie on your side and you're compressing your shoulder, that's painful. 
So anything that you can do to distract the shoulder gently and have all of the muscles relaxed is going to be the most likely, the most comfortable. I think um, one, one thing to maybe play with is if you're on your side, say you're on this side, um, see if your shoulder is like this, if you're sleeping on it, or maybe you can pull it under you a little bit. And I think this is a good position, kind of the hand kind of like that, but play with it. Sometimes you can just get in a, a funky position, but if you could pull yourself in more of a neutral position, it's, if you have to sleep on your side, then it, it could be helpful. Neutral is generally pretty easy on the body. So find your way to neutral and that might help. Okay, folks, it's time to wrap it up, but we will be here next week. Doc, thank you very much as always for the presentation and for answering all the questions here. Um, you, Eric. If you would like to subscribe, you can. Make sure you go to the newsletter as well where we email kind of the topic beforehand and give you the link and all that. So if you, you don't get the notifications on YouTube, I don't know how they work. I, don't, I never use them, but uh, the newsletter, we will definitely, uh, that's, you'll be notified of all the topics and whatnot before the show. So you can sign up for the newsletter. There'll be a link in the chat. And I think that is it. So if you had have any friends who complain about their shoulders, you could send this show to them. It might help them out. And until next week, take care. Thanks everybody. All right.